You've survived most of chapter 15. Now we just have to get through topic number three. And in this topic, we're going to talk about transport pathways. So in the last two topics, we introduced organelles, and then we talked about how proteins get into the different organelles, especially the ER. We wrapped up a lot with that ER. At this point, when it's in the ER, we're going to need to transport it out to a variety of places. So let's go ahead and talk through how these things are transported from the ER to the plasma of the membrane. So for this topic outline, we're going to talk about vesicles, we're going to talk about the secretory pathways, and we're going to talk about the endocytic pathways. As always, here's our topic objectives. Please let me know if you have any questions about any of these so we can go over them in class. All right, so let's get started with vesicular transport. This is transport of anything throughout the cell. Now, it can, it's not just proteins. There's a variety of uh, nutrients and things like that that can be moved through the cell via vesicles. So it's important to recognize that it's not just proteins bound to the plasma membrane. It can be from one pro, um, organelle to another, or it can be um, all the way to the plasma membrane, as we just talked about. So we're going to talk about how this works. We're going to talk about vesicle budding and fusion. So vesicles are formed from membranes and organelles. We talked about this before when we talked about and when we were in chapter 11, we we're talking about the formation of membranes. And they are essentially little sacs, and they can contain a variety of molecules. And there's two main pathways that use these vesicles. There's the secretory pathway, which moves molecules out of the cell, and there's the endocytic pathway, which moves molecules into the cell. Sometimes you'll hear the secretory pathway um, listed as the, exo um, the exocytic pathway, but um, for our for our case, we're going to use it as we're going to use the term secretory. All right, so vesicle budding. So what we do is we start with this area on the cell. Um, usually it's some kind of pit. Um, sometimes it'll be called the clathrin coated pit if it's a clathrin coat. Um, but there's a specific area on a membrane that is going to be gathering up um, components of or whatever it is that it needs to have. There'll be receptors or something like that on the cell. And what happens then is we have these adaptins that are going to come into place and they have um, an attachment with a coat. Now, um, in this example, we have clathrin. We know of some other ones, but clathrins are best understood, so it's the one I want you to focus on here. But just be aware that clathrin's not the only coat. And what these do is the cargo receptors, those little molecules, are going to bind to that specific receptor, and it's going to start to bud off into this vesicle. And as it gets more and more vesicle shape, there's going to be another uh, molecule that comes in called dynamin. And what this does is it pinches off the vesicle. And this allows the vesicle to now become free within the cytosol. And so this vesicle will then lose its coat and will then travel to where it needs to go to bind to where it needs to go. So this is how it is butted off. The coat doesn't determine where it's bound to. What determines where it's bound to is usually what the receptors are. So it's important to understand that the coats are just a variable of it. So now that it's a free naked vesicle um, in cell and it needs to fuse, we're going to talk about vesicle fusion. And once again, you should be fairly familiar with this because we did talk about this. And remember, sightedness matters because in this case, that, that, our, our, that item that's on the inside of the vesicle needs to end up on the inside of the target organelle. And so it's important that it fuses properly. So there's two main interactions that happen first. We have the RAB and we have the tethers. And so the RAB will come in with the tethering protein. And what this does is it starts to bring that vesicle closer. Once it gets close enough, it, the V snares and the T snares, which are those, um, as you can see them, they're the blue and red lines on the image. What they're going to do is they're going to bring that vesicle all the way in so they're close enough so that the membranes will coalesce and will fuse together to form um, a single membrane. So this is how the fusion works. It has to be very, very close. And this is going to cause the fluids inside the membranes to mix. It's going to cause the membranes to mix. This is actually how we can rebuild a plasma membrane if we need more. It's through this fusion process. So make sure you understand how we butt off and how we fuse. And it's important to understand those two because they, work, they are part of a cycle. So in the fusion, we have the pits the, with the specific receptors that are bound. They butt off um, a dynamin will uh, cut off the vesicle from the membrane. Then the adaptins in the coat will come off and then the, ves the vesicle will be free to move where it needs to go. And then it will come in here to where it's fusing and we have the RAB and the tethering proteins will bring it closer 
until the V snares and the T snares can attach to each other and pull it all the way close enough for the fusion to occur. So just make sure you understand both of those processes. So now let's talk about transport pathways. As I said, we got the secretory pathway and the endocytic pathway. Secretory moves out. Remember, you secrete things, you're moving it out. Endocytic means bringing it in. So here's a secretory pathway overview. Sometimes it's called exocytosis, as I said. Um, it's not, it doesn't really matter which term you use, but as I said, I'm going to try to stick with secretory for you. And it's using a variety of transports. And then one example is moving a protein from the ER to its final destination, the plasma membrane. So say we need to make new receptors that need to be sent to the plasma membrane. And so this is where the ER would come into play. So let's use this as our example and let's follow through the process of the secretary pathway. So we start in the ER and this is where we have the protein that has been fed through the different channels and what happens is the protein is modified first in the ER. And what happens is we have some common modifications. We'll have some disulfide bonds or we'll have glycosylation, which is the addition of a carbohydrate. Now it's just a standard glycosylation. It's not anything specific yet. And so what these do is these add different markers that these proteins are going to need when they get to the membrane. And it's all based on what the function of these proteins are. Every protein will be modified on its own. So after it's been modified and it's been moved through the lumen a little bit, then it's time for it to butt off and leave the, the ER. Now, how do we control for this? How do we make sure that only the properly folded ones, the ones that are properly tagged, leave? This is where chaperone proteins come into play. Chaperone proteins can detect when a protein is misfolded, and what it'll do is it'll actually hold on to a misfolded protein and prevent it from budding off, whereas the properly folded ones will butt off and leave the ER. Do you know where they're going to go next? Hopefully you said the Golgi body. So remember, the Golgi body is our main shipping warehouse. So everything's going to come in here, and the Golgi is going to separate and sort out these proteins. Now remember, the Golgi has sidedness, which means that the vesicles will only enter from the cis side, and they will always exit on the trans side. So it's really important you understand that. And there are a series of interconnected tubes, and what happens is there's a pH, um, a pH and other gradients within these tubes that help separate these proteins. So the proteins, based on their physiological traits, will separate within these tubes, and that's how they get into the proper budding, um, or in the proper vesicle to be sent somewhere else. The glycosylation and the other modifications we talked about that happened in the ER are continue to be modified here in the Golgi. So it's important to understand that this is continually modifying them. So these proteins are still not exactly what they need to be when they reach the plasma mem membrane until after they've gone through the Golgi body. So once they're released from the Golgi, now they head towards the plasma membrane. Now there's two types of release into the plasma or onto the plasma membrane or into the extracellular space. There's the regulated membrane fusion, and this is where there's a signal that will indicate whether or not or when these um, pat when these vesicles should be bound, fuse, and release. An example of that's insulin. We don't want to release it all the time. We're waiting for um, a signal of high glucose for that. There's also unregulated membrane fusion, where the transport vesicle will automatically go to the plasma membrane and will fuse and release. And it just depends on what the content is of the cell or of the vesicle and what its purpose is as to which one of these pathways is it's going to undergo. So now let's talk about the endocytic pathway. We have three main types. We have phagocytosis, pinocytosis, recept and receptor mediated endocytosis. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how these cells are, or how these uh, molecules are processed after they're brought into the cell. But it's important that you understand these three ways that things can be brought into the cell. The first of these is phagocytosis, and we think about this a lot when we talk about bacteria and parasites and immune cells, because this is cellular eating. They're going to ingest large items. Most of our cells in our bodies don't perform this, but the macrophage is the best example in human or in uh, multicellular eukaryotes that actually ingest things, and so it's important to understand that. Most unicellular organisms, however, will perform this regularly. They will ingest everything around, or they will totally ingest these large cells or these large pieces of debris and break them down. This is the basis for the endosymbiont theory. So we've talked about this before, is that, they brought, or that we believe that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts were brought into the cells and then began functioning through them. They weren't instead of being broken down. So it's really important you see how this works. I put up some videos on phagocytosis, and I encourage you to watch those in Blackboard because they're pretty interesting. 
The next one is cellular drinking. So all of this transport in and out of cell makes it so that we have a weird balance of plasma membrane and of, um, uh, of the cytosol. So it's important that we make sure that we have lots of fluid inside the cell. And so this occurs through pinocytosis. So what happens is that the plasma membrane, there's all these little um, vesicles that are going to form and bring in small amounts of fluid as well as remove extra plasma membrane from the from the plasma membrane. And so it helps make sure that we maintain that balance as we talked about in a couple chapters ago. So it just brings in all sorts of little um, liquid and maybe some small molecules as well. And then we have receptor mediated endocytosis. This is very specific. So the other two are not specific at all. They will bring in um, either the big large thing that they're looking at or they're just going to bring in anything that's close to them through the pinocytosis. In receptor mediated endocytosis, we have receptors, and they're in these clathrin coated pits, coated pits, like I talked about when we talked about vesicles. And what happens is these receptors will bind to their um, their target molecule, and then they will bud off in these clathrin coated vesicles and will head to the endosome for sorting. And so it's really it's really specific, and sometimes there'll be other stuff that will get trapped in there with it. But for the most part, these are going to be high concentrations of whatever substrate the cell needs. So this is something the cell specifically wants to bring in. And so as I said, after it gets brought in, it gets sent to the endosome for sorting. And this sorts the molecules in the cell. It determines where they need to go, what they need to do. Most of the contents are going to go to the lysosome. Do you remember why they're going to go to the lysosome? Well, we'll answer that question in just a second. The receptors in the membrane after they're brought to the endosome are recycled um, or degraded depending on the needs of the cell. So if we needed a whole lot of this one specific molecule and now we don't, the receptors will be recycled. But if this is something we need continually, they'll get, or if we don't need them again, they'll be degraded. If we need them continually, those receptors will be sent back to the membrane. So let's talk about the lysosome. Hopefully you remember that the lysosome is the final site for digestion in the cell. So this is why a lot of things are going to get sent from the endosome to the lysosome, because they need to be broken down so that we can use the parts for something else. And so this is what's going to happen in the lysosome. And so that's the main point is where most of the things that come in through endocytosis are going to end up in the lysosome. But as I said, if it's something else, a specific chemical signal, it may be sent directly somewhere else. And so this is the end of chapter 15. Please review your objectives for all three topics, take your quiz, and let me know if you have any questions about any of these.